and I'm going to allow a few more people in. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alex. Yes. Hi. Um, I have like a, a request. Sure. I have been in this program since the summer and I've been working very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And um, and I follow everything. I train everything. Mm -hmm. And you created mine, my task. Mm -hmm. And you gave it back to me with a zero. And I was wondering what I did wrong. My husband said, since you got a zero, that means that you got everything wrong. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, did I, I put um, feedback in there for you to read. Um, and, I didn't and, see anything. And I was wondering why. No, I, um, I, and this could be potentially, it's one of the things I need to ask Lisa about. This could be a, a mistake that I was making, but when due to the change in Blackboard, but when we first started and we were in the old Blackboard, we, we just put a zero if you didn't meet that minimum threshold. So they knew you had, so you as a candidate knew you had to readdress it. And then the feedback that we gave would tell you what was actually uh, problematic on there. So the zero yeah, doesn't mean you, you got zero wrong, but it's the feedback that should guide you on what you need to tweak or adjust. And you can right. be really close. I don't actually remember I vaguely remember, you teach Spanish, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I vaguely remember um, um, your submission, but it wasn't, a zero is not reflective of, 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 the, of what you were doing. It's just an indication that you need to uh, go back and look at the feedback and make some adjustments. Yeah, but so but you can't see the feedback. You can't, you're not able to see the feedback there? No, I didn't see anything. Okay, I'll, I'll go back and check and make sure that it, uh, but I saved it. All right, thank y'all. We appreciate it if you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm feedback. sorry. So, Lisa, is that not the case anymore? Are we still? Are we not using zeros to? I've um, I've still been using zeros just because okay. I think then it draws the attention to the person and it's not sitting it it with this blackboard it looks like it's sitting there ungraded even though many times it's graded it still says like need to grade or something like that and then it has the grade above it and people are seeing where it says need to grade and then they're saying it's not graded it's not graded so I've been putting a zero if it's not correct because then it just draws your attention to it and, and you know to go in and fix it okay so that's what I was doing let me see I'm pretty sure I wrote feedback but I'm going to try to find yours and I'll look and one person wrote feedback on mine, um, put it through the message in, in the Blackboard. Okay, it was so, sent through email? Yeah, so when I, mm -hmm. yeah, it was the only person that's done that. It was a person who did task four, um, oh, did, did it that way, which was fine. And I responded to her that way saying I resubmitted it and so forth. And uh, um, others generally, if I click on uh the task that i'm at there's usually feedback written in there okay uh, well um you know click on your thing they, they put i mean they put it different ways uh, the some put it right on the front page of where you of where they score mm -hmm. we'll tell you exactly uh, staring at mm -hmm. others put it inside where you gotta you know click on the task almost like you have to resubmit it and then you can look at your feedback yeah so it, um Ms. Ramos, it did um, record the feedback. Um, I'm not sure if what your screen looks like, what you see, but there's a little icon for feedback. So I think for me to be able to see it, I have to click on that feedback icon and then it opens it up. It's like a little purple text box. Right. All right. 
I'm going to mute and turn my camera off. And Alex, it's all you. It's all me, just me. All you. I'm the only one. <laughs> yep. Okay, so I, I only score one task. So then I hope this is a useful, um, a good use of your time. Um, and I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about the task that I score. It's task number 16, uh, which is higher order thinking. And I just wanna let you know some of the things that I look for in those task submissions. Um, um, I really try to adhere closely to the rubric um, when I'm looking at your scores. And so the rubric is in three parts. It's looking at the, the entirety of the lesson plan. And so um, one of the problems that I've been encountering in submissions for the lesson plans for task 16 is that they're not, um, if they're good, they're great, but um, when they're lacking, it's because they're lacking in specificity. Like it's not very clear at what point in the lesson or what points, hopefully at what points in the lesson um, you're um, using what techniques or what strategies or what activities to, uh, to engage students in higher order thinking. So those things need to be kind of mapped out in the lesson plan. I think of a, a lesson plan um, for this kind of a program as let me demonstrate that I know exactly, you know, what a lesson plan is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a roadmap for um, what skill or objective or concept I'm trying to reach. And then, and then the roadmap for all of the stops along the way that I'm going to um, be taking as I reach that destination. How am I gonna um, check myself and my students to see that we're progressing toward that destination, that goal, that concept, that skill. And so the lesson plan needs to be a, a very clear roadmap along the way. And so sometimes when those lesson plans are not specific enough, it, it makes it difficult um, to know when and how the, um, you as teachers are engaging your students in higher order thinking, how you're making sure each and every student is doing it and not just the, the natural ones who like to raise their hand and be verbal and engage, how, you know, how the, the quiet one, the more reserved ones are doing it. Um, so make that clear on your lesson plan, not just what your objectives are, but how you're meeting them for every student. Um, and then the second part of the rubric for task 16 is the assessment. And that's where the biggest kind of lapse in task 16 happens is that one third of the rubric for task 16 involves what assessment are you using? What assessment tool are you using to measure the extent to which students have met your stated goal? And then how are you helping the students to know how they're meeting the goal, how they're doing. So, so your assessment and your rubric or your answer key, whatever, whatever you use in your grade level and in your subject matter. Um, that's one third of the rubric for task 16. And, and um, a lot of the submissions that I've seen, candidates are putting the higher order questions on that third aspect of the task, the reflection worksheet but it's not evident in the lesson plan nor in the assessment that students are being engaged in higher order thinking. So that higher order thinking element has to be a huge part of the assessment as well as how clearly aligned the assessment is to the stated goal of the lesson plan. So there's, there's um, I think three main components for the assessment. It's how clearly aligned is the assessment to the um, stated goal? To what extent is the assessment engaging students in higher order thinking? And um, how clearly and how easily can students use the rubric or the answer key to help themselves know that they're on, ta on target for reaching that goal? Um, so that's the three elements of the assessment. And then the other third, the final third of the task 16 rubric is about that reflection worksheet. And the biggest weakness that I'm seeing in submissions for the reflection is that the rubric actually asks for specific student um, 
responses? Does the teacher capture specific student responses and specific student data and reflect on how those student responses and student data um, let them know how they're doing in that lesson to engage higher order thinking? And so the weakness that I'm seeing in that worksheet is that a lot of the description of student data is really vague. I get like a 70% of my students scored 80% um, um, or higher on this assessment. And it's, it's really vague and it doesn't really meet the language of the rubric, that section of the rubric for task 16. The, the third part of the rubric for task 16 asks for a really specific engagement on your part with student data. So what I would just, be an example of specific engagement? What would you um, be looking for besides percentage of 7% of my class does this and 10% of my class does this? Well, since it's a reflection, right? So that section of the task is a reflection worksheet. It's you as a teacher identifying, okay, a certain percentage of my students uh, met this, this threshold of mastery. And here's why I think it was only this percent of students, or here's why I think it was so many of my students. So it's specifically engaging with the data to the extent that you're looking back over what you did and figuring out why kids are performing at the level that they're performing after you did what you did. Right, does so that, that make sense? That, that's helpful because it just, you know, gives us, gives me an idea of what you're looking for. Okay. All right. So yeah, I mean, it has to be a purposeful, meaningful reflection. So if I do this whole activity and I realize that only, I don't know, 62% of my kids uh, reach a, a high degree of mastery on this assessment, I have to look back and think about, you know, what did I do or what did I not do? What, what worked and what didn't work? And that's the purpose of a reflection. I think um, a lot of the submissions I get, um, the candidates want it to look really good, want, want to look really um, everything. The kids all did great. This was a good lesson. And so many of them, you know, 80% of my students um, got a passing score. And that may be, and that's great if it is, um, but think about why, think about what worked in the lesson. But even more importantly, the reflection needs to be an honest reflection about what actually happened and what you as, as an educator can learn from that. Because Let's be honest, not every lesson works. And it's it's even more instructive to us in our practice to look at why it might not have worked. Why did it not happen the way we thought it would? Because that is a much more often a much more powerful um, uh, thing to think about because that can change things and, and make shifts that we need to make. So the reflection should be honest, I guess is in, in, in summary what I'm trying to say. It should be honest and specific. I have a question about that then. Um, sure. I teach middle school, we're doing block scheduling. I'm getting a whole new set of kids now starting on Monday or on Tuesday, I'm sorry. Um, I teach algebra to seventh graders. Okay. Um, is it possible that like, even though I'm supposed to, it's a gifted class. Um, so I'm supposed to include these higher order thinking questions like already in my lesson as it is because of the gifted program. Sorry, my dryer is going off. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's that little sound you hear, um, but the, I mean, uh, there's a lot of gaps. There's like, you know, they're skipping two years essentially of math, you know, going into algebra in seventh grade. So is it possible that some of that, like if, if it didn't work, like, are we considering other outside aspects? Okay, so that's Absolutely. something that I can- Yeah, okay. that's part of the whole reflection process. I have to look not only at my practice, but I have to know my students well enough and know the context in which I'm te teaching my students well enough to, to know oh, it might not have been anything I did or didn't do. It could have been X, Y, and Z, but evidence of that thought process needs to be in the reflection, right? And so seventh graders are taking algebra. I just wanna say, wow. Like it's been, it's, and now I have, I have seventh graders this coming semester that not only did they miss the last quarter of sixth grade math, but now they haven't had math all summer, all of fall. And now we're using block scheduling. So I'm already losing a quarter of my time. And then they're testing for the EOC. So it's been like a super, and, and I'm still kind of like learning what I'm doing. So it's been challenging to say the least. Holy smokes. And 
they do do they do do they <laughs> do have algebra in seventh grade they typically what they do is they come to the school in sixth grade and test the students and see who is working at that level or who could handle it and then they send them into that not thinking about the developmental ability of the students or where they're going or how, now how many math courses are they going to have to take once they've taken algebra in seventh grade that's um that's intense yeah that's really yep intense. Right. Okay. All right. Any other? Um, okay. So, any other questions? I guess is a, it's a good uh, time to take questions. Nobody has questions. Is it? Did you all print your um, print the information off of the state site to see what was specifically needed? Yeah. Has anyone started working on Task Sixteen? I know. I know. Uh, Ms. Ramos submitted hers. If you can use one of the lesson plans that you use for designing standard space lesson plans, then yes. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. I, I think that ticks most of the boxes. I'm not 100 percent sure though. And that's a that's a previous task. Is that what that no, is? it was one of the PDCP courses I had to do. Oh, on okay. So mm -hmm. I would say yes. Whatever we can work smarter, not harder, and cross pieces over from Beacon, <laughs> from um, you know PDCP, from different tasks that is fine um, okay, and, good. I don't know if this would work for other assessors but if you are doing that and that makes a hundred percent perfect sense to do it that way mm -hmm. um, but um, I know when I was doing my national board certification one of mm -hmm. the things that I did was that uh, <laughs> I would put in bold type the things I knew that particular assessor would be looking for you know like the the big um, things that they would be looking for to tick off the, the checklist items, I would put those in okay. bold type. So if you're, um, it might help um, your, the other assessors on the tasks if you just went through and you use the same lesson plan, but then you just put different things in bold type that those assessors might be looking for. Okay. Um, uh, like for me, when I'm doing task 16 and I'm reading your lesson plan, I'm really trying to see when um, you are engaging students in higher order thinking in what manner you're doing it, how you're making sure all of the students are engaged in higher order thinking, not just the, the, the highly vocal ones. Mm -hmm. So um, those, pro those steps, those activities, those processes for checking in, those formative assessments you do along the way, if you put those in, in uh, especially the ones that engage the higher order thinking in bold type, then I would be, they would stand out to me and I would be able to see them. Okay, agreed. Yeah, okay. um, because some of this does cross over for different tasks. So I think if you just changed it specifically to each um, task that's required for, then it would be easier to see. So, okay. you know, as you save it, go through and bold it for task 12, for task 16, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, make it specific to that one instead of them having to read everything and try and figure out what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. I do have a specific question, but it's not relating to this exercise. Um, I don't know whether I should ask you separately at the end, Lisa, or? Sure. Yeah, let's see if there's any more questions for this task or um, any more concerns specifically for this task, and then we will move on. Any other questions? No, I have a good. question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Andrea. Oh, so I have a question as far as the lesson plan template. Um, I know uh, it says there's part of technology part and uh, what do you guys mean exactly by technology, like assistive technology and technology equipment for teacher and or students? You mean that section on the lesson plan? Yeah. Um, I think that's for um, any um, technology you use to help students access either the activities or the concepts. Um, it could be um, if you have um, 
students who have motor skill problems, they, they, they don't write, so they have the, the keyboards. Um, it can be um, calculators. It can be um, anything that you use as part of that lesson to help students, whether it's students with disabilities or all of your students, um, so that they can do all of the things you need them to do in that activity. Gotcha. So it's not that it's um, it's not that it's technology for all. Like you know, the only reason why I ask is because not all my students, as a I teach algebra one for ninth grade, tenth grade, and not all my students have a cell phone. Not as my students can't afford a laptop, or so it's not. So I'm very limited, or I cannot play a hood because my classroom doesn't have laptops, and not all my all students have cell phones. So like the um. I'm limited on that. So that's why I was wondering like, what do you mean exactly by technology? But so so if, that, if that lesson um, requires students to use calculators or, or gotcha. you know, that sort of thing, you would list those items. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And who was the other, was that a, a, a male voice we heard? It was Patrick. Patrick. Okay. Uh, I don't have any more questions. I think you've answered a lot of what I was concerned with, or at least how to, what you're looking for. Okay. Because um, again, I'm a new teacher. I'm, even though this is the start of my, would be, is the start of my third year. It's been two and a half years. I still consider myself babe in the woods, trying to learn this stuff. Um, I, yeah, I, I would say I, I've been teaching, I don't know, 25 years. I've lost count at this point, but I would say that I probably didn't feel like I got my sea legs until about year six. Yay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, it's normal to feel like you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, in those in early years, I had days where I felt like, oh, I got this. And then something would happen and that feeling would evaporate instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and there are still times like I, many of you, I'm facing a whole new group of students on Tuesday. And this is a weird feeling because I'm a little bit tired at this point in the year. I'm not, I don't have that new school year energy to, to meet a whole new group of kids. Um, so I know if you're in that because students have to be able to um, recognize information they have to learn new information in most lessons hopefully they're going to be learning something new right um that's not higher order that's that's um uh, it's only after they you've transmitted that information that concept that skill that they can then begin to connect that to things they already know or um um concepts and skills from other classes that's where the higher order stuff um comes in so yes you should engage higher order thinking in every lesson, but it's not the whole lesson, right? Because that nobody can do that. We can't do that. Yeah. So is it safe to, to say that the higher order thinking, like part of these lessons, it shouldn't be like an introductory lesson, correct? It should be something that's more, okay. Well, you can, uh, yeah. Um, when you're just introducing a brand new skill or concept, probably not then, unless it's part of an anticipatory activity where you're engaging kind of their imagination and, and setting the stage for application of this and for, of the new concept or skill. But generally speaking, no, it's something that's gonna happen as they're learning the information. Question. So would like kind of like work problems or life scenario for math will be like a higher order thinking, um, not like a specifically, um, for, for example, this semester we're working with uh, vertex and, you know, like axis of symmetry and whatnot. So of course they need to understand all the formulas, all the math involved and everything. Will higher order thinking be like war problems as in like physics or would that be just part of the topic? Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure I understand your, your question. And as a, an English teacher uh, <laughs> right. on the spot, trying to come up with higher order thinking questions for, for mathematics is a little bit um, tough, but um, I think in general, um, practicing applying formulas in different circumstances or different equations if you if I'm using the verbiage correctly mm -hmm. is not necessarily engaging higher order thinking asking them questions about um, 
that engages their ability to connect why this formula works in this context and in this circumstance, um, as opposed to something that they've already learned um, is perhaps uh, um, uh, more function, thinking at a higher level. Also asking them to apply what they're learning that skill in a new, maybe less familiar context. I think if I'm remembering my math textbooks, as you progress through the practice problems that the math books give, the problems get a little less straightforward. Isn't that true as the, mm -hmm. the higher number of questions? So those might engage higher order thinking, but it's but that's still just practicing apply uh, a practicing putting that formula into practice. It's not connecting that to something else. And so I guess what we're looking for in the higher order thinking is helping them to understand the connections between the skills that they're learning and the, the concepts they're learning in math, how one thing builds on the next. So asking um, even exit slip kind of questions um, that ask them to explain why you're learning this concept after you've learned the concept you learned last week so that they can actually see the connections between what they're learning is, is a better way to, to engage that higher order thinking. Gotcha. I think I got, yeah, I think I got like the idea, especially okay. because, um, yeah, like I, I know what you mean. It's just my students as a title one, it's kind of hard. Yeah, to do. me too. <laughs> so what yeah. about using what about using bloom's taxonomy or that web's depth of knowledge yes are you all familiar with that no no you can research that online like it shows you what are lower level questions what words you can what words you can use to start a question with that takes them to that higher level depth of question wow. so it's Easy to research. Didn't you also um, a hand up for that? In your, uh, couple of the Beacon courses. Right. Isn't that going to be in the um, FSA um, rubric? Not the FSA, the state rubric. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have level three, level four in my language arts um, standards, state standards. It tells me what level um, of, on web depth of knowledge the questions are. Right. What level of complexity are they? So right. do they have to create something as an end product? Is it an analytical? Is it reasoning? Mm -hmm. So I would imagine the math standards are like that too, aren't they? I taught primary. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Oh man, I hate when I, I want, sorry, I just had, a, I was trying to find links to put in. I just put one, it's got a picture of the depth of knowledge wheel, but I hate when I try to find something and it's on Pinterest. I know. I just threw in Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the way this, I haven't looked at the math standards. I'm going to be hundred percent honest with you. So I don't, I don't know for sure, but I'm, it seems reasonable that you would have that information available to you. Like, and, and I think what is actually more helpful for task 16 is not just that wheel, but the question stems can mm -hmm. be really helpful in building um, higher order thinking questions. And I, I was just um, scoring someone's submission and there was one little piece of feedback that I gave that person that might be helpful to you. Um, the the uh, submission was really good and the questions were clearly higher order thinking questions, but they were kind of not anchored in any particular text or element of the uh, lesson. And so it, it's, it's not just engaging that creative thought that's important, but also making sure that it's, it's text-based. The, the critical thinking is, is text-based. So um, engaging whatever you're having the kids read, whether it's your science textbook, textbook, your math textbook, some little story that they've just read, um, anchoring those higher order thinking in something that you've read through the course of the lesson, something that they're responsible for consuming um, uh, through the, the act of reading that can engage higher order thinking and it connects that thinking to critical reading skills. 
Can I add something about the Bloom's taxonomy? Yeah. Um, on tax and task 12, when you do your pre and post assessment, it does ask you what the level of difficulty is to use Bloom's or Webb's um, complexity scale for those. So you will need it for task 12 as anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, um, if you have any questions while you're putting your tax text together, any specific, just a, a quick question, you're not sure if you should include this or if this is a good idea um, and you want to shoot me an email, please just do that. That's fine. I don't mind doing that at all. Um, giving you some a little bit of guidance beforehand um, so that once everything's submitted and put, uh, put in there, you're, you're you know, confident that it's ready to go. And question, does this have to be done while we're teaching or it can be past experience from last block semester? I mean, last semester, like, well, this current semester that hasn't been over. Does it have to be like next semester? I don't know if it has to be from what you are currently teaching or if it can be from, I, I'm pretty sure it can be from earlier in that academic year. Right? Yeah, because I'm teaching Algebra 1, like I only have Algebra 1, I'm, I'm, I'm just having a, a different, you know, like everybody is going to have like new students on Tuesday, so that's the only thing. I was just wondering if I could use the examples from last semester to write down um, like all this. Yes, and you can use all the wisdom you gained last semester to tweak it and adjust it and make it even Definitely. better for, for the coming semester, right? Yeah. Definitely. That's what I'm, I'm even tweaking my first week and it's taking me longer than last this semester. So, yeah. okay, perfect. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, any other questions about task 16 or anything in general? Any questions? Just a specific one. Okay. Um, what's the what's the the final date again? Where all of this and the Beacon classes and everything else has to be turned in? It's it's April. Is there March twenty second? It's March twenty second. Mm -hmm. So it's because the Monday after spring break. Because I, I, I signed up for one of the Beacon classes that starts on March 1st, and then I got to change that and, and do it in April, correct? Like do it, or not April, do it before. Well, the thing that I look at and um, that I give feedback to administrators on, so I'll look at, are you almost complete with everything? So have you turned in all of your portfolio tasks, even if they're not graded, but they're turned in? then I can let the administrator know that you have turned those in. Ha are you in process of finishing your last beacon class or do you still have five beacon classes to finish or three beacon classes to finish? You know, Is it presumable that realistic that you can have everything done by you know, um, a reasonable time and be completely signed off? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this for the ones that are are due this year or yeah so these oh. are the june 21st or june 2021 completers mm -hmm. have to have everything done by march 22nd so they're almost had a heart attack okay. or submitted okay. yeah no no heart attack for you you just joined <laughs> i am having a heart attack about the fact that i thought i needed 20 hours of esol and i'm in a 60 hour course mm -hmm. what are you yeah. trying to do to me well, they're all 60 hour course. Well, they're not they're all, but as um, a classroom teacher like that, you need 60 hours. It's the activity teachers that if they're not in PDCP only need 18 hours, mm -hmm. but you're in PDCP. So you have to have that cross-cultural communications, which is 60 hours. So I, I took cross-culturals and I took reading comp two. Mm -hmm. Is it just, it's just reading comp two. It's not reading comp, because I guess on the list, it looks like it, it says comp one and comp two. So is it, is it just comp two? It depends on when you joined. So you have to this have, year we, and the this great is my, wisdom. Don't uh, you have to have one before you can do two anyway, because they're, they're no, step by step, no? No, no. Um, 
in the great wisdom of the state of Florida this year, they decided that in the group that started in um, January 2020, 2020, so it was last year, that they have to have, if you're a secondary teacher, you have to have reading comp one and reading comp two. If you're an elementary or an ESC teacher, you have to have one through four. Yeah. So I started the year before that. So I'm, I'm okay if I just completed reading comp two because that's what it was initially said. That's so I, it was I never- initially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I know you need to um, send some love to the people that just joined. Oh my word. Mm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of reading, I have to have my endorsement done by the end of June and I've got one and two, so I need to do the exam. Yes. Um, which is why I think I'm going to die before I get everything done. Um, probably from stress. Um, I don't know what else to to say really. I wrote to the um, de, um, Department of Education asking if there was any opportunity to maybe get an extension. I haven't heard anything. So well, the um, on our web page on um, endorsement page, there is a bunch mm -hmm. of study guides. And Brevard County, we actually have one of the highest pass rates for the reading endorsement exam at like 85% where the state is running around 50 to 52. Okay. So there are great, great study guides on our endorsement page on the, um, on the BPS website. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just need to do this. Um, what's that last course you have to do? Standards-based but... lesson plans. No, the um, the the last thing you have to go to Pearson and test for the professional uh, the education. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with with last year not getting um, not getting observation and not getting evaluation done because of what happened at the end of the year, um, are we going based on uh, our what, like what we got the first, like my first year, um, don't ask me how, but I got rated highly effective and that should have, I guess, is that, that still exempts me from taking that professional knowledge test or no? The way it reads is it's your most recent, recent. summative evaluation. So whatever your most recent summative evaluation is, is the one that you submit. So let's just pray that I don't get evaluated. <laughs> is that an annual or a semi-annual? Can you use an, a semi-annual? Mm -hmm. Your most recent summative evaluation. And I don't have to do that professional well, knowledge test? Submit it to me because that way I can give it to Dinah Kramer and Dinah Kramer is the final say on it. I just got a four yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So it needs to be signed okay. in blue ink by your administrator and yourself with the yep. date. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it has to show like highly effective rating on there. It has to say those words, like highly effective, and um, then submit that. You know, we're not a public school, so we. I okay. Um, I can't remember what it says exactly. I think it tries to follow the BPS um, layout as closely as possible, but I can't right now picture in my mind what it says yep just send but. it to me and then that way i can share it with dinah and we can go over it all right thank but you lisa it's the one perk one of the perks of pdcp is if you have highly effective on your summit summative you mm. are exempt from the professional certification prof ed tests okay that would be good mm -hmm. <laughs> hooray for new uh, director of education yeah um, any other questions? So I, yeah, I have one, Lisa. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm confused on these dates. Um, originally, I thought we had until our certification expired, which was June. Then this year we heard April 1st. Now you just said March 22nd. When did that change? That changed with um, Dr. Green and her plan of um, rehiring. So there's a reappointment timeline and her reappointment timeline, um, Cohen, our information having to be submitted and turned in 
aligns with Dr. Green's reappointment timeline. So everything has to be done so that your administrator can say, yes, you're good to be reappointed because you have everything done or um, you are not complete yet. So you would be, um, what is that? What's it called? NP, what is, um, N, encoded. Which means what? That you don't have a job right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, sir. So if I am not subject to having to worry about being rehired or reappointed, does that mean I have till the end of June? Or do I have to fit into the timetable too? We try to adhere to the same timetable. <laughs> I know, I know, but yeah. I might need a little bit extra time. Just and that, you know, as long as everything is submitted, all of your portfolio tasks are submitted. Your classes mm -hmm. are either, you've finished all of them or you're almost finished with all of them, you mm -hmm. know, because there's some of the classes in Beacon don't end until the 1st of April, you know? Yeah. I can say you're there. You, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got but three. I can't points. say that in, you know, the end of April, the middle of April. At that point, no. I've already had to let your administration know that you are not done. And then they will have to encode you. And you can complete during that time, but you will not have a BPS job right at that point, you know, once the school year is done. And it, I'll tell you, last year it was taking at least three months for certificate for um, your certification to be processed. Okay, so you're saying that I have to have my, I should have everything ready to go to get recertified by the end of March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And and I know some of you came on later, but we were talking earlier about the extension. Yes, there is a two-year extension. Yes, the state said that there's an extension. However. We, um, the superintendent, your administration signs off yes or no, they approve of you having the certification, I mean the extension and know that you've applied for it. Number two, then it comes to the district and the district superintendent or assistant superintendent looks at your information, reviews whether you need it for medical reasons, there was extenuating circumstances, you were highly effective or, um, what was it, Medi or military, if your husband's military or your wife's military, for those reasons. And if you fall into one of those four criteria and you have the documentation, then the district would sign off, yes, we approve of your extension or no, you do not, we do not approve of your extension, but we do not have the final say or the superintendent does not have the final say. It goes to the state then and the okay. state is looking at the information now. And they said this year, they are really going to look at the information to see, did you do what you need to do? Are you working towards completion or are you sitting back slacking and just trying to get that to your extension with not doing anything? There are other districts that have teachers that have been teaching for eight years on a temporary certificate because you can do your three-year temporary certificate, take a year off, come back and teach. You know, so we have all these, in the state of Florida, we have teachers that are sitting out there multiple, multiple years on a temporary certificate. But there is an opportunity to extend if there are extenuating circumstances and you're highly effective and you are actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And I will tell you, COVID is not an extenuating circumstance. Bereavement? Unless... Bereavement? I don't know about that. Mm. Yeah, I don't make that determination. Okay. Okay. Um, that information will be released the early part of February, and okay. it is not going to everybody. It's not going in a leadership team meeting memo or anything like that. It will be probably sent directly to you, and then you'll have to have that conversation with your administration and have that supporting documentation. Okay. My administrator is actually the one that suggested I try and get an extension. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. We'll see. All yeah. right, so you so you would go to your ad, admin first, mm -hmm. and then do everything out. Then follow up with them. Right. Okay. Well, I'm not looking for an extension, but it's always it's good to know if you freak out and 
I want to just you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, so that there is that option now. Um, it is not something that we encourage or you know really want everyone doing, but there are extenuating circumstances that require that. And as long as you're showing that you are trying to finish. Mm -hmm. Right, and like that's not that. just taking one course and saying, oh, I'm trying to finish. You right, know, right, that's right. multiple <laughs> things are done. You've ten, done multiple tests. You've, you know, you've been working towards completion. That shows it. Right, right, right. I'm not thinking, okay, I did one course back in January. I'm good. Last year, I'm good to go. <laughs> well, some people do. Again, think about your students. What do you have in your classroom? That's what we have across the state. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm doing three courses at the minute, don't you? <laughs> I just point that out. 60 hours, 30 hours and five hours. Just yeah. through a couple of weeks. I know. I um was I met with AP1 teacher or administrators yesterday, and mm -hmm. I am constantly trying to get them to understand what PDCP teachers are going through, what it entails to be part of PDCP, and all the requirements that are placed upon you and all of the the tasks that you have to meet and that you have to complete. So I am pushing that word out there. I'm trying to get that out there for you. Appreciate it. So with, with the beacon classes, cause I guess I just, I must've missed something. Like I, I, I feel like a lot of the things um, while there was emails and stuff like that, like maybe it just didn't click for me. Cause I was just, my brain is thinking about a hundred other things. I have three little kids. I'm a single mom. Like not that it's an excuse, but it was really, really hard to, to like really kind of put it together when, and then in Blackboard change and I couldn't find anything for a couple months. And then um, I, I guess with the, the Beacon classes, um, I signed up for all of them because I, I just now like reading the stuff and the emails that we got and the posts and the messages that I just recently got from, from, I believe it's you even, mm -hmm. um, I, I started having the kind of research and look it up myself. So I pulled up the beacon classes and I, I, I try to sign in to all of, it. I try to register for all of them. So I got approved for one. So as I finish it, is that, is that like when I I'll be allowed to go into the next one or, or I usually do that? two at a time. So I time. usually I'll allow you to take two at a time. There is one professional, um, professional educators thing. That's only five credit hours. So yeah. if yeah. you're taking so, two with that one, then you can do three because okay. that's a pretty easy one. Okay. And the other thing is, is that a lot of people, um, if you've done the ESC PDA course that teaching, um, teaching students with disabilities. Yeah, the one it's on the 20 other hour, side. yeah, on fiddlers. I'm almost done with that. Can, yeah. Yeah, yeah one day. Do that. Finish that in one day, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can? <laughs> yes. I mean, it's yeah. like a solid day of my kids were testing today, so I had a chance to right. get a little bit done. Right. Right. Yeah. You guys get vacations too. Mm -hmm. Now with three kids, I don't. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. But I teach 52 weeks so yeah that's rough yeah okay. that's what i signed up for mm -hmm. i have 12 students right now i'm not complaining <laughs> really no. i'm not going late um i grade task 4 12 and 18 and task 4 the submissions have really gotten a lot better which is nice um task 12 and 18 go together and what i'm seeing a lot of is when you're doing task 12 you're not not you, but I'm not seeing a lot that can be um, taken into task 18. Your pre and post assessments, you're showing that growth from task 12 to task 18. And I think, I know due to COVID, we've had a lot of, especially with block scheduling, it's really difficult to keep the same group of students. Um, so I guess I would, because Lisa and I've had a few conversations on this on what we're what we need to do about it, and I don't know what the right answer is. But if you can do task twelve and eighteen with the same group of kids, that's your best bet, so you can show growth on um, the lesson plan that you submit. If not, I would think it would be okay to have in task twelve one group of kids maybe from the fall. And then in, if you have to do task 18, say in the spring or winter, then that would be a different group of kids that we could at least show some growth of the same lesson plan. Cause it has to be, um, you know, I had one person submit their Eureka assessment and then they would do the pre-assessment and on the post-assessment task 18, you show which numbers had growth and which numbers didn't and why there wasn't or 
maybe there was a lot of growth. And that's, you know, to compare the two tasks together. And what I'm going to recommend, um, and I talked to another district about this, is do your tasks together that require mm -hmm. the, um, you know, have multiple tasks. So I know there's one for unit plan one, unit plan two, two. do unit plan one, unit plan two together, even though they're in different blocks. Don't right. worry about, about the blocks right now, get those tasks done. Because, you know, I know some of you in, in the secondary, nine weeks are gonna be done, poof, and then right. we're gonna be on to a whole another set of students. So do the, do the tasks to back to back, are together that require that um, sequential order. You and know, then you wouldn't have to worry about a different group of students. Right. And I know task four, the professional development one um, mm -hmm. that I grade has a second part to it, but I don't grade that part. So I don't know which task that is. Task but 20, it, so get it done now. Oh, four and 20 are together? Mm -hmm. Well, there mm -hmm. you go, see? Yeah. You can get four and 20 knocked out right away. Um, right. Yeah, and that to me makes the most sense, especially with the block scheduling, because usually when you had the full year, of course, you could, you know, have that time, but it's best if it's done with the same group of students. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I understand that it can't be, but, it, you know, if it could, that'd be great. Right. So don't worry about the blocks right now. Just right. get the se sequence done of tasks of, you know, the if that's possible, that would be a great suggestion because then four and 18 and or not. 12 and 18 and four and 20 could go together. Mm -hmm. And that I would... thought 20 was the last thing where you put everything together. I've been waiting on that. No, nope, task 20 like... is professional development. So I should have probably done that when I did four. It's, it's, I do have to say task 20 is a pretty simple task. So I, you could do it now. I'll do it now. <laughs> Get it over with. Yeah. Because yeah, I did four and I didn't realize 20 was with four. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to kind of do them in order of, <laughs> um, you know, one, two, three. Yeah. Working my way, except for the unit. I did unit one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, so I try and keep, I try and keep the units and whatever together. I didn't realize 20 was with four. Yeah. Yep. I'll work All on right. that. Well, it is 625 on Thursday night, right before a three-day weekend. <laughs> and um, I'm going to see if anybody has any other questions. Anybody needs private chat? Lisa, I have um, a quick question. Sure. Um, it's Samantha Turner. Um, I see that one of the things is the 20 hours of the teaching students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I saw that you can test out of the ESOL or the um, reading endorsement by taking a test instead of doing the class was wondering if I have my ESC certification, does that get me out of that? Nope. Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping. Yeah, even if you have your ESOL certification, you still need to take that ESOL class. Gotcha, so the reading is the only one you can clip out of, for lack of yeah, a better Yeah, that was new. They just decided that in September. Previous to that, you had to do all four classes. Gotcha. Oh, all right, thanks so much. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, thank you. I hope you all have a great evening and a wonderful three-day weekend. And email me if you have any questions. Alexandra and Kelly are more than happy to help also. So keep in touch. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, ladies. Thank you.